Obviously, you're busy as an actor. You're in this major movie. You're in a lot of other movies. How do you fit in your activism with all that and a family? It's tough. Um, it's being really surgical about, you know, what I can do, like prioritizing. That's probably the biggest part. Mm -hmm. Explaining to my family that I'm, you know, they ask me, are you going away to work? You're going away to work on the environment. If I'm going away to work, they get very upset with me. Mm -hmm. If I'm going away to work on the environment, they're like, okay, you could go. Um, but it's, it's a balance. And uh, to be honest with you, I, you know, I, other than the joy that I get from my family, I really don't have much of a personal life. It's mm -hmm. mostly my work and, uh, and the environmental work. Yeah. Obviously, Dickinson is committed to sustainability, and that's, you know, of course, why we're so happy to have you here. What is it about Dickinson's mission that made you want to come here for the Rose Walters Prize and to become uh, part of our community for the residency? First of all, just the, the, the history of the college in this space is, is, is remarkable. Um, and the people who have come out of this college and, and moved into this space and the things they've done. When I look at the project, the programmatic side of the school, and one of the issues that I really work with and that got me started it was water. Uh, really, the hydrofracking fight in New York State was pivoting on, on the contamination of water as, as, as a major component of it. And, um, and you know, I, I'm very interested in, in data. I believe that data, above everything else, should, should, be, should be sort of um, guiding our debates. And there, I saw a, a woeful lack of data on the environmental side. Most of the data that the environmental ha side has to rely upon is either industry produced or, or produced by the state or colleges. And I see the future of um, the commons and, and really the idea of how to protect it um, in, in the hands of the communities, um, in, the, in the hands of um, students of, of alarm. Right, sure. Your, your, your alarm, uh, I, I think your, your, your alarm program here, which is a, a water monitoring program, uh, is, is an amazing uh, start to what could be put all over the United States. I know it's been here for 30 years, but just in the past five years, you started to move out into the rest of the nation. And um, with the novel and newer and easier and cheaper testing technologies, we could start to really create a, a wall of defense. Um, that will deter polluters, but also make it easier to catch them when they do it. Yeah. Now, fracking is, is banned in New York State right now, isn't it? Correct. Are you fighting to ensure that it stays that way? Do you see any, like, resistance from, the, I mean, you must see resistance from the industry yeah. coming back at that. How do, you, how do you see that playing out? Well, the SKIs just came out, which is uh, basically the regulations that would hold out, you know, the, the, the nitty-gritty of what a ban means. And it's looking very good. I mean, w you know, we're, there's aspects to it that need, need work. But what we're seeing is that the state government is holding to the spirit of a ban through the ESCAIS. There's a couple things that uh, we're all working together towards um, to, to make it a little bit more uh, ironclad. Um, but we're also, which is amazing, is um, there's a whole movement for renewable energy in New York State. And there's a race co sort of going on between New York State and a few other governors uh, throughout the nation who are forward thinking to, um, to see who is doing the most and the best. And so um, I think one of the ways that a place can ensure that their water and their air quality and the quality of life is sustained is by moving to renewable energy. Right. Do you see any hope for fracking, let's say? Is there a way, do you think, on the horizon somewhere where it could, it could work and it wouldn't be dangerous? I don't see it. The problem with hydrofracking is that there's a few problems. One is the use of water. It, it, it uses an enormous amount of fresh water in a time where fresh water is becoming more and more precious. Not only does it use it, but it, it's very hard to recycle it. Uh, every well, 13, up to 13 million gallons of fresh water are used to frack one well. 
out of that 13 million gallons, they could only pull up, or between 5 and 13 million, they could only pull up about two-thirds of it. The rest of it has to stay in the ground forever. Out of that water, a, an enormous portion of that has got to be deep well injected because it's coming up with so much contamination that it can't be put back into the system. So you're losing fractions of the table water. On the planet, there's only 3% of fresh water. That's, the, that's all there's ever been, and that's all there will ever be. And when you start taking from that and never putting it back in, then that 3% that we've all, the entire planet, has been sustained on is being diminished. Mm -hmm. And so you're running a giant mass experiment that is completely out of control and without any understanding of where you're headed. In a time when, with global warming, we're seeing these massive rolling droughts. That's one aspect. The other aspect is, is when you drill a well hole, you're actually creating a pathway between contamination down here and your aquifers. And so it isn't so much that somehow the fracking fluid is going to work its way up a crack or something. The fracking fluid and the contaminations are working their way up into well aquifers from the very well that you're drilling. And these wells are, they're, they're failing. They're failing at 6% by the industry's own numbers. They want to, they want to drill 55,000 wells in the next 10 years. Just in the East Coast or is that nationwide? And nationwide. And so you're inviting an enormous amount of contamination. And once the aquifer is contaminated, there's no way to remediate it. It's done. And so you have those issues. You have the fact that uh, if we're going to follow the science of, of climate change, <laughs> I, I can't even believe that I have to quantify that with an if, methane is between 30 and 70 times more damaging a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And the amount of methane that we're losing in transporting uh, fracked gas or extracting fracked gas blows by any benefit that, that the gas, the fact that the gas burns uh, twice as clean as any other fossil fuel. All of these issues together make it not only unsafe, but incredibly unwise. The fact of the matter is, right now, we have the technology to move past this age-old way of uh, uh, powering our world. What alternative energies are you most excited about? Well, right now, wind is basically, so, so what made, what's made alternative energy difficult is the pricing. Um, but what we've seen in, in throughout history, fossil fuels rise at about 12% above inflation historically. Um, but we're seeing uh, renewable energies are dropping every year. We're about two years away. We're at parity right now with wind. So it's just as ex it's cost the same amount to put a, a wind turbine out as it does to power your house with, uh, with natural gas or you know, coal. Okay. Um, we're about three years away from solar being at parity. At some point, there's an inflection point, and then we're going to pass it. Fossil fuels, because there is a finite amount of them, and because it's getting more and more difficult to extract them, long gone are the days where we just put a straw in the ground and beautiful concentrated carbon just comes floating to the surface, or we just scratch the surface and there's coal there. Now we have to do deep sea drilling, we have to do hydrofracking, we have to do mountaintop removal, we have to do tar sands, it's, and it's very expensive to do these. The, the industry is heavily subsidized by our taxpaying dollars. If we were to pull those taxpaying dollars away, it would be a done deal. Fossil fuels would be done because renewable energy and the electrification of our transportation system would be so much cheaper. But see, we don't know what those costs are because we're never giving a true accounting. And so, what's going to shift this whole thing is economics. It's always been economics. And that's where we're at. So last year, over the last, since 2008, we've brought on more renewable energy, wind, water, and sun 
then we brought on fossil fuel uh, generators for electricity. Now that's a trend that will never go backwards. If you look at Bloomberg, they'll tell you it's already done. Now, has it made its way out into uh, the world yet? No. But you have this incredible uh, economic opportunity. You have 50 million homes in the United States that are ready to receive solar energy panels. How's that? How are they, how are they ready? What they're, do you mean? They're, they're, they're perfectly situated. They get enough sun. They're in, they're in, they're in enough places. And, and it would save the people who put them, put them on their houses money. Now, the race is, and this is where all the money is, is who's going to get on those roofs first. And so you have people like Elon Musk, you have Sungevity, you have all of these independent people all rushing. This is the last uh, untapped market left in the United States. And that's exciting because there's jobs there, there's grid stability there. It, it is a, um, a very, cons it, it hits on a very conservative principle where the idea is I should be able to create my own energy and store my own energy and sell my own energy as I see fit. And that is a, that is a, and competition, it creates competition. Now the utilities are essentially a monopoly. When you start bringing in solar and you allow people to start creating their own energy, you're, you're, you're immediately creating competition, which drives the market down. That's another pr conservative principle. So those things, those dynamics that are coming into focus now are what makes me feel very uh, excited about what's happening in the world.